I'm really excited that everyone uh, is out tonight on this, this, uh, this Zoom event. Um, we've got a pretty good crowd, it looks like. Um, just a quick reminder is to please keep yourself muted. Um, we will be um, having a Q&A at the end of the uh, conversation, um, and you can submit questions through the chat. And also just a heads up that we are recording this, um, this talk, so um, if that's uncomfortable for you any, for any reason, well, you've got to figure out how to deal with that. But um, sorry, uh, but we felt it was important to be able to share the, the talk later as well uh, for people who couldn't be here tonight. So um, I'm excited to be here with you all tonight. I'm Justin Kimball. I teach photography at uh, Amherst College, and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, the filmmaker, Adam Levine. Hello. Um, and Adam is going to be moderating the questions tonight um, when we get to that part. Um, this event is the last in a series of artist talks that Adam and I have arranged uh, for a class we're teaching called Art Can Help, which we shamelessly stole the title from um, the Robert Adams book that recently came out a year or so ago. Um, I admit that when this, we, Adam and I first came up with this class that uh, right before the semester started, I, I was feeling so badly about everything that was going on in the world that I started to wonder if we shouldn't have called the course Can Art Help? I, I have lost faith a little bit. Um, but in the, in the, so far this fall during the semester, both the students and the, uh, the work that the students have been making and the visiting artists that we've had come in have really um, uh, refreshed me and, and heartened my feeling about, in fact, uh, I think art, art can help. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, which brings me to our tonight's speakers, um, Jess Dugan and Mary Statzer, um, whose talk tonight, Art and Activism, I'm sure is gonna leave you equally uh, hopeful about the power and necessity of art in our world today. Um, in the interest of time and Zoom fatigue, which I think we all have at this point, I'm going to encourage each of you to go on and, and uh, read about um, the accomplishments of Jess and Mary, which are many, um, and I will forego uh, reading them to you tonight. Um, I'm just really excited that both of them are here, these people who are completely dedicated to their fields, and I can't wait to hear them talk about their work uh, together. So. Without further ado, um, we'll get started by turning it over to Jess and Mary, and please give a warm wave of, of welcome to them since we can't. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, and welcome, you guys. So take it away. Thank you, Justin. Um, so happy to be here tonight with everyone and with Jess in conversation. Jess, you want to say hi before we actually get rolling? Oh, sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining, especially on this, this fraught political eve. We're, we're really happy to be here with you tonight. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to dive right in, Jess, um, and ask you um, to start us off by talking briefly about your projects, Every Breath We Drew, um, Family Work, and To Survive on the Shore. So if you could just give us kind of a brief overview of those projects, that would be a great way to start. Perfect. Absolutely. Yes. And, and before I jump in, I, I also just wanted to say thank you to Justin and Adam for this invitation. I'm, I'm really <coughs> happy to be here tonight. And, and thank you also to Mary for um, agreeing to be in conversation with me. You were the, the, the first and chosen uh, curator to come to mind when, when I first spoke to Justin. So I was really honored you said yes um, to, to doing this with me tonight. So yes, I will share with you a little bit about the three projects that are really the pillar of my practice. But before I do that, I wanted to start with this image. This is me when I was eight years old and I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, looking, as you can see on your side-by-side -side Zoom comparison, most likely not so different from how I look currently. And from a very early age, it was reflected back at me that there was something about my identity and specifically about my gender that wasn't what people expected of me. I didn't look and behave the way a little girl was supposed to look and behave. And so I grew up with this incredibly heightened awareness around um, gender and the way it affected my experiences in the world. And, and I like to share this image before I share my work because all of my work as an artist comes from a very personal place. It comes from my own identity, my own experiences in the world. And so this image is an important touchstone for that. 
And then luckily I moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts right before high school. And um, I came out as gay when I was 13. I started questioning my gender shortly thereafter. And I was not at all a school dance kind of person. I was a, a somewhat angsty art student, as I'm sure is not a surprise to many of you. And um, I was also very politically involved. I did a lot of activism. I worked with nonprofits. And so as a political gesture, I decided to run for prom king. And my uh, photography teacher, Archie LaSalle, who some of you in, in the Massachusetts area might know, just covered the photography room with signs of support and it was incredibly touching. But anyway, long story short, I ended up winning Prom King. And so I hadn't really thought that through. And so I had to go to the prom. And so this, this was my prom photograph. And, and again, I put this in um, as a kind of touchstone because my identity has always been very politicized and I've always chosen to embrace that politicization and that has affected my life and my work. So with those two, two touchstones in place, I'm gonna share with you work from three projects. The first is Every Breath We Drew and I'm gonna give you a, a somewhat brief overview because we have other, other aspects to tonight's conversation, but um, for, for folks unfamiliar with my work, I at least wanted to, to share a bit from each project. So. Every Breath We Drew is a long-term portrait project. It's primarily comprised of portraits. And it's really about the intersection of individual identity and connection with others. So whereas some of my other work is about a very specific identity, as you'll see in a little bit, this project is more about the process that we each go through to understand who we are and how we how we connect from that place. So there are themes of queerness for sure. There are themes of gentle masculinity. I'm especially interested in looking at ways of being masculine that are more emotional and complex and more vulnerable than what we're typically taught. And part of that for me is because I have had to define my own masculinity in the world in a way that is, that is more gentle and that works for me. So that's a theme. Um, this is an image of me and my partner. This is one of the earliest ones we made together. So there are some images of couples and you'll see that this led into another project that I'm going to show you. Um, there are some still life images in this. And for me, these function as metaphor for uh, the need we all have for connection, the need we have for relationship, whether it's uh, personal, intimate, communal, um, friendship, the, 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 this need we each have to really be seen fully as ourselves. So the still life images allow me to talk about that without depicting a specific couple. This is a brand new image from this series made a couple of weeks ago um, here in St. Louis. And so for, for this project and for all of my work, the way that I work is very slow. It's very collaborative. I work with my camera on a tripod. I use all natural light. Um, in the more recent work, I've been photographing really early in the day or late in the day to get a kind of quickly changing light, a kind of intense sunset light. Um, and I work very collaboratively with my subjects. So there's a lot of back and forth about what kind of poses feel comfortable to them, feel authentic to them. I do a lot of directing as a photographer, but I'm always seeking to direct people into a version of themselves that feels authentic. So um, again, this project is very subjective. There are a lot of uh, literal self-portraits, but in some ways I think of it as an extended self-portrait because the way that I choose my subjects is very much about me and who I'm drawn to and um, seeing things in them that I either see in myself or want to see in myself. So. Um, it's different from some of my other work, which you'll see in just a second. And this is a new still life image during the pandemic. I've been making a lot of self portraits and still lives at home. And again, to me, this is a reference for two people, a reference for a relationship. So this is something that's ongoing. I'm very actively making new work for this right now with a few exhibitions coming up. Um, it's, and great it's, to see, it's great to see these new images um, filtering into images that I'm more familiar with. So yeah, thanks for bringing in some new images to see tonight. It's like Thank you. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been making quite a bit of new work for this project um, since finishing To Survive on This Shore, which I'll, I'll get to, but, um, and especially during the pandemic, I've been, I've been trying to work on this as much as I can. Uh, we can talk about that more a little bit later too, the, the, the pros and the cons. Um, and again, I mentioned that there are literal self-portraits in the project. Um, this is actually one of the ones that we'll come back to later that 
that Mary acquired for the museum. Um, yeah, so I'll pause. I'll pause with that. And here's one installation view. I didn't want to put too many in tonight, but I did want to give you a sense of how the work exists in a physical space because the size is important to me. My uh, smaller photographs are 18 by 24, the larger ones are 30 by 40. And it's really important to me in a physical space that the work is large enough that a viewer can come approach it and have a personal engagement with it, but not so large that it becomes larger than life and towers over you. So the way that I present it in a physical space is important. And, you know, obviously since we're on Zoom tonight, I just wanted to give you a sense of, of how that functions in the museum space. And, and Mary and I will be talking more about the museum space later. So the second project is uh, work that I'm making with my family. I began this work in 2010 and I have photographs of me and my mom. This is one of us from 2012. And then I met my partner, Vanessa, who you saw the one picture in Every Breath We Drew, also in 2012. And we've been making pictures together since then. And so this has grown into also a long-term project. This is something that I don't yet exhibit physically. I, I really imagine that this is going to take decades to become complete. This is something that I see as an incredibly long-term project. Um, but for you know the students on the call in particular, but also for others, one thing I love about this as a photographer technically is that photographing the same people over and over over a long period of time really requires me to make different kinds of pictures. And so it's, it's, a, it's a formal challenge and a practical challenge as well as being important to me personally. And I also love that um, this, is, this is most true with the pictures of Vanessa, that this project allows me to talk about all the things I'm interested in in my work, which are identity, sexuality, gender, family, relationships, community. Um, but none of those things are, are foregrounded. The thing that's foregrounded is this family and, and my relationships. And so it gives me some freedom conceptually. So my partner and I have a, a daughter. And when my partner Vanessa got pregnant, I started photographing her. So this has also become part of this work. This is a picture that I made of us um, in the hospital shortly after my daughter Eleanor was born. Um, and you know, when I started making these family pictures, I, or, or pictures with Eleanor, I should say, I was thinking of it just as an extension of my personal documentation of my life. But I very quickly realized, you know, this has only been two and a half years, but I very quickly realized when showing these images in lectures or, or sharing them with a few people that there's a real lack of images of queer parenting and in particular butch parenting or transmasculine parenting. And so, now I'm also actively thinking of this project as, as creating new representations and, and you know, filling some of that gap that I perceive, which um, is something we'll talk about in, in all of my work, but Mary and I will also talk about. This is my mom with Eleanor. And then there are images of my mom and her partner. This is from last summer in Provincetown, Massachusetts. This is a, a more recent one of Vanessa, also in Provincetown. I tried to put in some, some extra Massachusetts images for you all. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is very recent. I, I, since the um, pandemic, I haven't traveled much, but I did make one trip by car to Boston this summer. And I made this image with my mom, which is a revisiting of, of the earlier image I showed you. And this is a, one from about a month ago of Vanessa and Eleanor. We actually have a whole series of them against this garage door. This is in the alley be behind my house. And um, I didn't want to put all of them in tonight because to, I just wanted to keep it a little bit more brief. But this is something that we do every six months or so. So the third project I'm going to share with you is called To Survive on the Shore, Photographs and Interviews with Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Older Adults. And this project I made in collaboration with my partner. She's a social worker whose work focuses on the intersection of um, LGBTQ communities and aging. So when we met, we realized that even though we were in different fields, we had overlapping interests. And we knew that there was a lack of images. There was a lack of representation of transgender and gender expansive older adults. And we joined forces and we realized that we could create a project that would at least begin to fill this gap. So this project was born, we began it in 2013. And 
We photographed and interviewed 88 people throughout the United States. We'll talk a little bit later about the, the end product of all of this, but for each person, we, I made a portrait and then we conducted an interview that was edited down to a uh, text that lives alongside the photograph in both a book space and an exhibition space. So I'm going to share with you just a few images from the project, but I'm going to begin and end with a quote. So let me hang on here. I got to make my little screen so that I can see the text. Okay. So this is Didi's quote. Didi says, my middle name is Ngozi, which means God's blessing. I was speaking on HIV and my journey with HIV in the church one night and this African minister just jumped up and said, you're Ngozi. I said, uh, what do that mean? And he said, it means God's blessing. You have God's blessing. So I adopted that name when I sent my name change in and then I had my last name changed to my husband's and then we was married. I served collard greens and ham hock and baked cakes and he's just as happy as a lark after the 25 years we've been together. This coming into my real, real fullness of knowing why I was different is because I was expressing my spirit to this world and I didn't know how God felt about it, but I believe in God and I have a deep spiritual background. And I talk with the Holy Spirit constantly who's taken me from the Lower West Side doing sex work to being at the White House. We created the first trans ministry in our church and I sat on the motherboard with the other mothers. One day, Mother Gladys asked me to come and sit down there with them. And after we had our little meeting after church, Miss Gladys went to do something in the office and then they surrounded me and said, what gives you the right to be here on this mother's board? We don't understand it. I said, because I'm a mother to the ones you can't love, the ones that you cannot be a mother to, that you throw out on the street every day. Those are my children, the ones you throw away. I said, that's why I'm here. You could hear a pin drop, nobody said nothing. They went on and accepted me and said, come on girl, sit down. I'd go to the clinic for my HIV, I would do stuff. I'd push patients, walk them to the car, sing church songs. I was just having a ball while I was waiting for my appointment. And a guy saw me one day that had an agency and he said, Miss Dee, Dee you work down here? I said, no. He said, I got a job for you. And that was God just setting me in right there in that clinic with my own desk and I was my own boss. I could go to work as myself. The first day I got on the train with my little briefcase and my little suit on with the other people that were going to work. And when I got to the front door of the clinic, the spirit stopped me and said, look across the street. I said, look across the street. So I looked. Then I saw flashes of me jumping in and out of cars on that corner and I remembered I used to run girls off that corner. That was my corner. He said, now look how long it took for you to cross the street. I could have lapsed right there on the sidewalk. This had come full circle now. So I wanted to share at least one quote so that you have a sense of, of um, how the portraits and the text pair. But I'm gonna show you a few other images from the project. So as I mentioned, um, we began this in 2013. We worked on it for five years. And from the very beginning, we sought diversity in the participants. And we sought diversity in terms of age. Our youngest participant was 50, our oldest was 90. We sought diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, gender identity and expression. Some of the people in the project transitioned, some did not. There were all kinds of, of gray areas in there. Um, we also sought diversity in terms of socioeconomic status, geographic location. We went all over the United States. It was limited to the United States, but within that we tried to hit every major region. We went to big cities, small towns. Um, we really wanted as broad of a group as possible. And then last, we sought diversity in terms of life narrative. So we wanted people who had had very different experiences. Some people had come out or transitioned in the early 1970s. Other people had transitioned as recently as 2016 when we were making the work, 2017. So it was really important to us to seek, um, to seek diversity in every way. And, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, but um, that process of, of finding people was very intentional. This is Caprice. This is, this is one of my favorite pictures in the project, um, although I'm fairly certain she had set up this entire scene before I arrived. <laughs> And then this is Grace. So, so most of the people in the project I met for the project, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but Grace was actually someone I had known since I was a teenager. I used to walk across Harvard Yard from the bus station to my high school and Grace uh, 
would also be walking the opposite direction every morning. So I met her when I was a teenager. She's um, a longtime activist in Boston, very well known, um, and was also the, the first portrait I made for the project. So I'm going to read you Grace's quote, and then Mary, I'm going to going to give it back to you. So Grace says, I always felt more like girls, like women. Even when I was watching movies or television shows or reading books, the female characters were the ones that I identified with just sort of instinctively. So I knew I was born male, but I certainly was a feminine boy growing up, a genderqueer boy, and was harassed and bullied and got a lot of negative attention because of that. I was assumed to be gay from the earliest get-go as well, even though it wasn't talked about then in the 60s. So I was called all the names associated with that. Sissy, faggot, fairy, all of that. I didn't feel like I was transsexual. I didn't have that profound sense of body dysphoria that lots of transsexuals report, even though there were things that I wanted to change. So the way I understood that and was able to express that in the 80s was maybe what we would now call genderqueer. That term wasn't used then, but I lived in another gender space. I just was living in this third gender space. I didn't see it as on my way to anything. I've been lucky to have people in my life who have been supportive of me in my journey, wherever that would lead me. So it was less about giving me guidance on a specific path and more about people who have said, your identity is evolving and that's a wonderful thing and we encourage you to explore that and go with that. I still see myself as on a journey. When I received an award a few years ago at a conference, I said, in the 60s, they called me a sissy. In the 70s, they called me a faggot. In the 80s, I was a queen. In the 90s, I was transgender. In the 2000s, I was a woman. And now I'm just Grace. And Grace's quote, uh, Grace's quote is one of my favorites, perhaps for obvious reasons. But one thing I really love about it is that she traces her individual journey through this larger social and political landscape, which, which I think is very important for this project as a whole. So I'm going to pause Mary there with the introduction. I know that was, that was a, lot of, a lot of talking and images. A lot of great images. And I'm also really glad that you, um, did, you know, also read some quotes because I think they're so um, important to the way this uh, project functions. Um, and I know it was important um, to the way it functioned in our space, and we, we will talk about that. But right now, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking about, you know, seeing these bodies in quick succession, uh, bodies of work in quick succession like this, and um, knowing that we're here to talk about um, how um, art can help. Um, could we talk a little bit, or could you um, talk a little bit about um, whether, you know, I'm wondering if these bodies of work correlate to different types of activism or different types of ways that art can help. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, my work as a whole swings between being incredibly subjective and coming from a personal place and sharing my own story and being a bit more outward looking and a bit more documentary. So for me, the work in Every Breath We Drew and the family work, um, that work has an element of activism that I think comes from telling my own story in the family work, which I think is really powerful, and also making certain things visible in every breath we drew in a different way. Um, you know, to survive on the shore always had a more overt educational and, and uh, outwardly activist mission from the beginning. So that work feels to me like it functions in a different way. But I believe very strongly that sharing your own truth can be um, incredibly powerful and can be really important for others. And when I was a young person, the work, the artistic work that I responded to most strongly was that kind of work where people were speaking their truths. And, and that made space for me to come into my own. And that's something that I try to do in all of my work. And I think that's, that's one way that the more personal work functions as activism, even though it's a little bit less obvious, perhaps, as something like to survive on the shore. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, in 2017, uh, you made a, a video titled Letter to My Father, and it's something that we included in our presentation of To Survive on the Shore, which was not uh, initially part of the package show that we took. Um, but just for those of you who haven't seen it, um, 
in Letter to My Father, um, Jess narrates a letter, you, you narrate a letter that you wrote um, to your estranged father and combine it with photographs and snapshots of you, uh, your family and friends, um, as well as you know, photographic portraits. Um, I would argue that it's, it's one of your most personal um, um, and emotional bodies of work. Uh, the one that draws um, very directly from your own story. Um, could you talk about the process of making Letter to My Father and what it has meant for you to share it um, with an audience? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Mary. I, um, I, I shared with Mary before tonight's presentation that I actually have yet to speak about this work publicly because it's, it, it is, I think, uh, in some ways my most personal work and it's it's a different vein than than my other bodies of work um so i had tried to make some work about my father like mary said we're estranged now but we've always had a a, a complicated relationship and i had tried to make work about it a little bit earlier in 2014 and i had you know kind of gone through my own archives and scanned all these documents and pictures and it ended up being an artist book, but I just felt like at that time it didn't quite come together. And so I kind of set it aside. And then in 2016, I was, I was offered an exhibition at a university gallery here in St. Louis. And the exhibition was meant to be Every Breath We Drew, but there was this separate video room in the back. And you know, this idea had been percolating in my brain for several years at this point. And then you know, the combination of that with having this physical space to imagine, I started conceptualizing this as a video piece. And, and as Mary mentioned, the soundtrack is me reading a letter to my father that, that um, is inherently rhetorical. It's meant to be rhetorical, but it's me kind of trying to come to terms with our relationship. And so it, it traces my childhood. This is one of my school photos, which I <laughs> think is really funny, but it also just kind of, you know, captures my, my masculine childhood. Um, and, you know, my father was never comfortable with me and that, that was a through line of our relationship. And so in the letter, I'm really trying to come to terms with our struggle, but also, you know, the ways in which he himself is um, perhaps emotionally unable to be there for me. I'm trying to see it from his point of view. Um, but also it was really a way for me to process my life and, and what I was going through. So it's comprised of archival photographs, as you can see. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I was looking to it for, there are these moments in the video where it's very clear that I was sort of looking to my father for uh, examples on how to be a masculine person. And, um, you know, it just never quite <laughs> was the right role model, you know, that always kind of missed the mark a little bit. Um, and then the video traces me coming out, my like emerging queerness. This is me and my first girlfriend when I was 13, and then traces some other relationships, people that were important to me. Um, and then it also goes through my present relationship with Vanessa. And it was being in that relationship that I think really allowed me to, to kind of come to terms with, with what my relationship with my father had always been. Um, this is our a picture from the day we got married. It's, I'm sure all the photographers are shaking their head. This is the only picture I have and it's like blurry and <laughs> it's like a blurry <laughs> selfie. It's terrible. But, um, but this was really important because our marriage and, um, and sharing with my father that we wanted to have a child was really the beginning of the end of our relationship. And so this picture plays an important role in the video. Um, and then the video bounces back and forth in time. It's, it's not um, chronological. So it goes back, this is me as a baby. Um, and really, you know, Mary, you feel free to jump in, but I think I'm, I'm trying to understand where my father was coming from as much as I'm trying to make sense of my own um, experience and, and upbringing. So um, the process of making this was uh, incredibly difficult. I, I kind of drug my feet working on it, which is, is not something I really ever do for my other work. I'm always ready to make work, but I found it really hard to, to just jump in. Um, and I would often come down from the studio crying. And I think, you know, I systematically went through every snapshot I had, whether it was analog or digital. I looked at every single picture I have. And so, and I scanned the ones that I thought were important and I kind of sorted it. But um, so that process, I think, was incredibly cathartic 
for me. And that's, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this tonight when I haven't talked about it before is because of this theme, Justin and Adam of, of art can help and thinking about how, you know, this is for sure the piece um, in which I did the most kind of healing while I was making it, that it was the most like visceral for me to work on it. All of my work allows me to kind of process where I'm at in my life, but this one was, was a whole other level for me. And so, um, so the process, like I said, I looked at all of my photographs. This is a shot of my studio wall when I was actually making the video and I, um, you know, gathered all of my material and then I, I, I literally storyboarded it out like this. And then, um, you know, the actual compiling it into a, a video file took me like two days, but the making of it took me a year because it was, you know, figuring out how, what story I wanted to tell, how I wanted to tell it, what images I wanted to include. and. So anyway, so that experience was very emotional and um, it was important that the venue where I was going to show it, the, the, the layout was such that if this video just totally, I, I knew that if I got to the end and just it either failed or I wasn't comfortable showing it, I could just kind of close off that room. And I found that combination of having a space but it not being a lot of pressure was really important to make this. So I showed it in, in 2017 in that exhibition um, very nervously and got some really good feedback. And I was, I was sort of struck by how other people related to it, um, even if their circumstances were very different from mine. I was thinking of it as this highly specific story because it's mine. And it became clear to me when I started showing it that it had this universal element of the tension of needing to be yourself and wanting to be accepted by other people. And I was pleasantly surprised and I guess, you know, saddened to learn how many people relate to that. Um, so the process of making it was one kind of catharsis for me. And then the process of showing it was actually incredibly healing. And I showed it here in St. Louis. And then the next year I showed it at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, which was a you know bigger venue where I knew more people would see it. And I, I sort of slowly built confidence. So um, we'll talk more about the video at UNM, but now it's something that I, I do show regularly. And um, you know I, I very much consider it as a part of my primary work where for a long time, I kind of thought it was just this side video that I made. Um, and I've realized it really informs my other work. So maybe I'll pause there, Mary. Yeah, okay, that sounds good. Um, I, I hate to leave, but I have lots of questions about it. And thank you for um, talking about it tonight. I know it's not something you usually do, and I'm glad that you did. Um, I learned some things, you know, just in this brief uh, conversation about it. Um, but I would like to talk more in depth about To Survive on the Shore. Um, I think it's a really beautiful and important body of work. Uh, it's one that's brought, that has brought you national and international attention. Um, and the tour continues. Um, in fact, it's gonna be on view at the Photographic Center Northwest this spring before traveling to another museum, which we can't announce quite yet, but just uh, look for that announcement soon. It'll be shown um, in, starting in July, right? Yeah, this summer. So um, To Survive on the Shore exists in several different forms. Um, it's a museum exhibition, a community exhibition, a book, and a portfolio. Um, you've also placed it in three different archives dedicated to the preservation of LGBTQ history. Um, why did it need to take so many different forms? Also, um, you know, could you touch on the logistics of creating uh, a project of that kind of complexity and then did you know what you were getting into when you started? Did you have an idea or did it, did it sort of um, expand as you began to work on it? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, let me jump in. I'll talk a little bit about the process and, and we'll absolutely answer all of those questions. So, you know, as I mentioned, we started making it in 2013. The first participants were people we knew through previous work. We had both worked previously within trans communities. Um, and for the first two years, it was really word of mouth. It was sort of person to person. And then in 2015, some of the work was included in this article in the New York Times that was a larger article about, about trans aging, not just about the project. And um, this was a really pivotal moment because it introduced the work to people throughout the country. And I got a lot of emails from people 
wanting to participate, wanting to support it. So this was really important for the making of it. Um, and I, I, the way that I met people was, was still through word of mouth, also through this kind of, this kind of outreach and press. But I also traveled to several conferences and presented the work and met people there. I reached out to nonprofits throughout the United States and had them connect me with anyone they thought was um, important. And then I also sought particular people in the community who were, who were significant or had been significant activists. Um, so this is one of the first showings of, of the work. This is at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. And, you know, it's very important to me that my work is in a museum space in part because um, a belief in the importance of representation is a driving force in why I make my work and I, I want it to be in this space. But I also want it to be in the community. And with this project in particular, I felt really strongly that it needed to have a community element. So alongside the MOCP show, I organized with the museum an exhibition at the LGBT Center in Chicago, the Center on Halstead. And so that's what you're seeing here. And this was just a, a waiting room. So people would encounter the work when they weren't intentionally seeking out um, an art or a artistic venue. So in 2018, we made a book. I always wanted the work to be a book. I love books. That's how I discovered photography. I also think there's something really intimate about looking through a book. It's, it, it's different than the exhibition space. So from the very beginning, I knew it would be a book. And um, as we sent the books to all of the participants, we would get these pictures back of them with the book. And, and I learned later that many of them had their page number memorized, which I thought was particularly sweet and touching. Um, and then, you know, as we did programming for the book, we really foregrounded the participants. Instead of us giving talks about it, we would invite people to come and share their story. And, you know, this project is so much about telling the stories of the participants, whereas my other work is, is very much about me and, and my story. And so I felt really strongly that that should carry through the programming. So this is from a, a book release at Women and Children First in Chicago. This is from Expo Chicago. Um, I always invite the participants to be involved in any programming whenever possible. So Gloria came to the art fair and spent the day with me and um, nobody wanted me to sign the book. Gloria was definitely the only, the only one that people wanted to sign the book. So that was really, really sweet and charming. And then um, around the time the book came out, we had this press moment and it started with this feature in the New York Times and um, really went from there. And this was amazing in so many ways, but it was also complicated because it brought the work onto such a mainstream scale. And for example, I did a Instagram takeover for the New Yorker photo account and, you know, 85 to 90% of the comments were positive and then the, the remaining percent were just really awful. And I struggled with this because I feel such responsibility to the people who've trusted me to tell their stories. And so I, I reached out to many of them and they basically told me it's fine. We've heard this before. Don't worry about it. But there was this complicated thing that happened bringing the work um, to such a mainstream level as well. So this was the first uh, solo exhibition. This is at Projects Plus Gallery, uh, an arts organization in St. Louis. And then, um, oh yeah, and so uh, again, I always try to involve the participants as much as possible. So this was from our opening night. This is Steph, who's, who's local. This is John, who lives in rural Arkansas. He, he drove up to be part of the, the festivities. And then for me, the exhibition is, is not the end, it's the beginning. So I always try to organize a lot of programming. Mary, we can talk about that um, in specific, uh, specifically with UNM. But when we had this first exhibition up, we had a lot of class visits. This is a social work class from Washington University. We had community events. This is a storytelling night that we organized in partnership with local LGBT uh, organizations here in St. Louis. And then that exhibition's traveling. So this is at the Provincetown Art Association, Art Association and Museum um, from last summer. And then Mary mentioned the portfolio. So because this, this work had such an educational element and component, I designed a limited edition portfolio that included 12 photographs and interviews. And this was made available exclusively to teaching institutions, teaching museums. So this is placed now throughout the country and um, museums have exhibited part, of, they've exhibited the portfolio in part or in whole, they use it in the study room to teach classes. And I really hope that this has a broader reach, not just reaching photography students, but, but students in, in all disciplines. 
So we also wanted the work to exist in a community space and the museum exhibition comes with certain um, requirements around insurance and cost and, and climate. So we wanted one that was available um, very easily to other spaces. So this is a community exhibition we created. This is at a, a synagogue here in St. Louis. This is at the social work school at Washington University. So this is something that's also available and, and continuing to travel. And then, as Mary mentioned, there's um, the component of donating the work to archives. And then there's also the element of using it for advocacy. So we're partnering with several nonprofit organizations to use the work in any way that they would like to, whether it's for educational um, initiatives or political initiatives. So um, the project really had, you know, five or six kind of end goals. And then, uh, or end, uh, what's the word? End, uh, not products, but, you know, end results. Um, to answer your question about if we knew what we were getting into, I definitely think the project took on a life of its own. And, um, you know, when we first started, we imagined having 40 participants and it just, we hit 40 and it was just clear that we weren't done. And so it definitely was something that we felt like we, once we started it, we really had to honor it and, and kind of see it through. Mm -hmm. So I'll pause there and give it back to you, Mary. Okay. Um, yeah, so To Survive on the Shore and Letter to My Father were on view at UNM Art Museum this time last year. Um, I wanted to just um, walk you through a little bit about how, um, how that came to be. Um, I, so I had been at UNM about a year and it was clear that it was a politically progressive campus. Um, the faculty and students um, wanted to see the that kind of um sort of political stance reflected in our galleries and in our collection so i was actually on the lookout for something like this um that uh would sort of uh, speak to our students and faculty um in a way that i've been hearing they wanted wanted so i was you know in an effort to be responsive looking looking for something um and so uh, I was doing Center um, in Santa Fe's portfolio review and just ended up on my list. And um, I, so I was um, looking at Jess's work um, prior to that um, experience of portfolio review. And uh, I was just, I was blown away by the portraits. And I don't even think I read any of the interviews at that point. It was one of those like, oh my God, I've got to like prep for this thing. And I, you know, didn't. <laughs> You know, I saw I, I, I took the little time I had to get ready and, and that just involved looking at the images. Um, but when we um, sat down together for that very brief um, review, it was almost in instantaneous. I was, first of all, I was um, kind of bowled over by your ability to talk about the work that um, I had this um, sort of immediate reaction that I could learn from you in a way that I thought was going to be sort of productive for um, me personally, as well as um, I knew it was going to translate well to our students when we did programming and things like that. Um, and your organization was evident and like it was this was a package show and just, you know, on a nuts and bolts level, um, we needed a show at the museum that was ready to go, you know, and um, that's just, that sounds a little, I don't know, um, it's very practical, but it just, in a museum with, you know, six people on the staff, sometimes you have to ha make those practical um, uh, decisions. And so I was just thrilled to find a show this sort of, you know, impactful and beautiful and strong um, to, to, um, to include. So you're looking at installation shots here um, of the show in our um, exhibition space um, at UNM. Um, I was actually looking at um, prior installations shots that you had on your website of this um, show just for ideas and guidance for how I was going to lay it out. And I noticed that there was a video in one of your um, one of your installation shots and I'm like, you know, I got curious and just asked you, you know, and that's, and it was a letter to my father. And so that's how um, I sort of found out about it because it wasn't anything that we had discussed or not that I remembered. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I had just tried to watch a documentary on, you know, trans experience and it was awful. I, I, I can't remember the title of it. And it's probably just as well, because no one should watch it. It was just horrible. And, but um, when I saw Letters to My Father, I, I was just kind of thunderstruck by um, the emotional honesty and the emotional, you know, integrity, the nuance. Um, it, it moved me to tears. I watched it, you know, a few times over a week, the weekend, and I just, you know, was really impacted by it. Um, and I showed it to my colleague, um, our curator of education, um, you know, that Monday after the weekend that I saw it. And she, she also, I mean, we kind of sat in my office, you know, taking it in and, and um, being really moved by it. But any, at any rate, we found a spot for it, you know, <laughs> um, even, and it wasn't part of the contractual, you know, um, aspect of this of the to survive on this shore exhibition um but we've made a space for it and 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 found a corner for it where it was kind of isolated we could treat it as a separate you know separate but related um piece to to survive on the shore and um and i was really interested in i just felt like this needed a wider audience and that our students um you know if if they had difficulty relating to an exhibition that um, dealt with people 50 years and older, I knew that this one would kind of hit right at the core. And, um, and as it turned out, both piece, you know, both work, bodies of work um, were emotionally resonant for um, our students and, and faculty and the community. So um, I, you know, it really, you know, both, both bodies of work struck a chord and um, kind of equally, actually. Um, we did get comments like, you know, people were grateful to see this work. It was really meaningful to them. Um, the programming that we did um, was largely, we made our exhibition space, our, our museum sort of open to the LGBTQ community. Um, to uh, run their own programs. Um, I don't have any pictures of those because those were all private events um, that, you know, that wasn't about the museum, wasn't a, really about even serving our, um, you know, our students, um, which is normally our one and only focus, um, but it was about offering something to the community. And so there were some wonderful events there. Um, like Sage, uh, New Mexico had a, a wonderful event. But um, Jess and Vanessa um, did also did a panel discussion and, and uh, please chime in at any point. I don't have to monologue on this, Jess. But um, you know, it was great to have DeSanti, one of the subjects who's from Santa Fe, um, come down and be a part of that, um, to bring your project to recognize that it, it touched um, our community at a local level, um, which was really meaningful. Um, Jess and Vanessa also hosted a successful student forum that um, was the highlight of, you know, one of the highlights of my year to see both of you in conversation with students from across campus um, and to watch you sort of open up your, you know, personal and professional lives. It was like, no question was off limits. And that kind of generosity is both evident in the work and evident in how you present it and make yourself available to the institutions that show it. Um, that also translated, um, we, um, I actually remember when you said, we've got one more of the portfolios left. <laughs> are you interested? And I was like, yeah, I'm interested. And I'm not in any, I'm not in any sort of place to make the purchase. And so I had to miss out on that. Um, and that just kind of gnawed at me. Um, but it led to something I think that's actually much more important, which was for UNM Art Museum to establish um, an acquisition fund for diversity and equity, um, of which um, your work was our first um, the inaugural purchase, which I'm very proud of. Um, the process of selecting the images was um, very collaborative. I um, rallied um, 
oh, 10 or 12 faculty and students from UNM that came in in small groups and had, we had the most amazing conversations about your work. And I um, was guided by um, my colleagues um, in making the selection. It was some of the most, you know, the, the most fruitful and productive conversations I've had since I've been at UNM. Um, and I was reminded of uh, um, this uh, first image on the, on the left, um, what, um, I remember someone saying to me that this picture was so important because it talked, it spoke to them about, um, about trans families and um, that there was so little representation of that and how hopeful that image was to, to this um, person. Um, so I think, you know, your family work also um, serves that kind of function. And, and I was reminded of this picture while you were talking about it in that conversation, which was really touching. And um, one of the reasons why this picture ended up in the group of, of five that we ended up mm -hmm. getting. Um, the museum was able to purchase four and Jess and uh, Edelman Gallery uh, graciously uh, gave us a fifth, which so now we have a selection of large scale works and smaller ones that are a little bit easier to pull out into our print study room. So I think we're covered um, and very excited about having this work in the collection. We get asked about it a lot. It's been out and we haven't even had it in the collection a year yet and it's been requested um, many times in our study room. Um, so uh, other outcomes that um, were really important for us, um, having this exhibition led to um, us offering uh, sens sensitivity training to the entire College of Fine Arts at UNM. Um, we uh, got you know, gender neutral bathroom signage for the museum um, during this time. Um, we- I think Mary, you can see one of those in this picture, I think. Yeah, <laughs> which wasn't that. intentional, but it's there. And I remember when I visited the museum, I was like, oh, it's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we really wanted to invite the community in and, you know, there's, it just doesn't make, doesn't make any sense, you know, to not make us, I mean, it's part of making pe people feel welcome to have that. So, um, also, uh, we, we, our marketing uh, director at the time um, designed some incredible gender, gender pins that we sold for like $5 a piece and that yielded um, a $1,500 donation um, that the museum made to the Trans Transgender Resource Center of New Mexico. So as far as I know, that's the first time the museum has been able to do a fundraiser and give back to the community, which we were all really proud of. Um, just a 20% increase um, in our general attendance numbers happened during this show. It's the highest and the highest visitation rate among students that we've ever recorded. Um, it beat out um, our student attendance for the Frida Kahlo show, which was incredibly popular. Um, I see some people smiling. They know what kind <laughs> of uh, Frida Kahlo is. And it was a great show for us too, but this one really resonated with the students. Um, we sold, you know, 80 copies of the books, which um, mostly to students, um, and that's like our entire book sales for normally for a year. <laughs> so students wanted this book; they wanted it in their lives. They wanted to have their own copy. I'm just it just as a as a sort of um, benchmark for what it really meant to our students. So that's what I wanted to say about it. Was there anything you wanted to add, Jess, about? I mean, it was just, you were so generous to come back for our fundraiser. Um, you made two trips to New Mexico in like <laughs> two months or something when you were really busy, so. No, it was great. I mean, I, the only thing I would add is that I, I was, I mean, poor Mary's heard this like 50 times, but I just felt like the museum and, and you in particular, Mary, just did everything right and did everything that I hoped would happen. I really want, like I said, I want this ex exhibition to be the beginning. And with all the programs you did and bringing the students in and the training and bringing in so many community groups, I feel like it really had, it really reached its full potential, which was really exciting for me. Like just bringing the pictures and putting them on the wall doesn't really do it, you know? So I was just so touched that 
um, our collaboration made it possible, you know, made all of these, thing, these things possible and that um, it really did what I hoped it would do. It, it touched all these different notes and people and yeah, it was really wonderful. So you, you set the bar high for, for all future curators and museums, so. Oh, well, I wanna give a shout out to our curator of education, who, uh, Tracy Quinn, who, um, who did most of that, you know, so you know, she was instrumental in that happening. And uh, she's not at the museum anymore, but we, uh, you know, she was a huge part of that. So I wanna share that credit. For yeah. sure. So we, um, we're going to pause the formal part of our presentation here. We just put up our contact information. I'll leave this up just for a second for anyone who wants to screenshot it or write it down. Um, but these are our websites, emails. Um, I guess I should only speak for myself, but feel free to be in touch with me. Uh, <laughs> Mary, can, Mary can weigh in about her email. But um, yeah, thank you all, you know, so much for, for joining and we're going to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I'll see all of your faces, which will be so nice and um, really open to any and all, all questions. So um, I'm going to stop sharing it now and looking forward to more of that conversation. So I should say this is where, thank you again so much to Jess and Mary, both of you for speaking and, and Jess for sharing your work. Um, I'm going to do my best to moderate the Q&A. So anybody who wants to um, see some coming already, put a question in the chat and I will do my best to get everyone's name right. If I mangle somebody's name, um, hopefully it will soften the blow that I'll do it in an English accent and you'll find it somewhat charming. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so please post your question in the chat and I will field those to, to Mary and to Jess. So um, I'm just reading right now. So this is uh, from, from Kathy Edelman. Jess, I recently shared your video with the museum curator in the hopes he would purchase it for the collection. And his comment was he loved it, but that he felt it was more a visual diary or film than a video. What do you think? Kathy, you got to ask me this publicly. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the chat. It's in the chat. You didn't even text me. No, I'm just kidding. Hi, Kathy. Um, yeah, you know, I think that's really interesting. I, I, I think that's, that's probably also true. I think it is, um, I think it is kind of, you know, it's, it's heavily diaristic. I can see it being more of a film, you know, Kathy, you know this better than anyone else. When I first made it, I didn't really know how to position it, whether it was going to be on, whether I was going to put it in film festivals or whether it was an art piece that I wanted in the museum space. And, um, you know, the, the decision I've made thus far is to show it in galleries and, and museum spaces. So, um, but yeah, I absolutely think it, it has an incredible diaristic element and, and personal element. So, you know, I, um, and again, you know, Kathy knows this and, and other people know this, but I, I'm such a capital P photographer that I almost can't speak to the nuances of, of like film versus video and kind of, and you know, Adam, that would be maybe your, your area. But, um, you know, I think that's really interesting. I, you know, to be totally honest, I'm not sure exactly how it will exist in, in museum spaces longer term. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that we, you know, the gallery and I have, have relatively recently decided to make available for acquisition to museums. And that's partially because I finally felt ready um, and felt like it was a significant part of my work and, and I wanted that to happen. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think we'll see kind of how it ends up finding its home, if that makes sense. Hey Jess, um, you know, I, I know we talked at, at one point that you had, you've shown it, you know, with sound ambient and also with headphones. We had it with headphones, mm -hmm. um, but can you talk a little bit about like, you know, what, what the synergy might be between, you know, um, other bodies of work that you've shown it with to have this kind of voiceover, the highly personal voiceover um, in combination with other images, other bodies of work? For sure, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. When I first made it, I just, and I think we always do this as artists. We think our work is more different than than other people think it is. But I thought it was so different from my other work that I wanted to keep it separate. And in that first exhibition venue that I mentioned, the video room um, was right next to the room with every breath we drew, and we didn't have headphones. We had audio in the room, and so it kind of spilled over. And I remember during install 
my first impulse was, you know, absolutely not. I don't want these two to meet. But I very quickly realized that they inform one another. And there was something interesting happening hearing my voice in the room with every breath we drew. Um, and then later, you know, at UNM and a couple of other places, I have shown it with To Survive on This Shore. And I also think that functions in a different way. It provides my very specific story around, you know, gender and coming to, you know, reckon with my own family when a lot of those stories from others are on display in uh, the texts in the next room. So I think it dovetails well, it dovetails well with both projects. Um, and I've come to really understand that, that it's, it's a, you know, integral part of my work that, that not only coexists with my other work, but actually directly informs it. Right. Thanks. Thank you, both of you. What else, what else is there, Adam? So uh, this is from Juno Rosenhaus, um, and it's for Jess. How has photographing so many MOC people impacted the way you think about your own masculinity? I do know. Um, I, so MOC is masculine of center for folks who may, may not know. Um, you know, I don't know that one came before the other. I mean, I think part of why I'm interested in photographing people who, um, such as myself, who were assigned female at birth, but present somewhat more masculine or, or have transitioned or whatever their particular um, place of feeling comfortable is. I think part of why I was drawn to that is because that's also who I was. And that's, you know, me, my own community and me trying to understand myself. So, um, you know, my earliest work was really just people within my community and, and it grew from there. But I think, I guess I would say not just folks who are masculine of center, but my interest in masculinity more broadly, also in folks who were assigned male at birth, is a way for me to really understand my own masculinity in the world, particularly in it being more gentle. And, um, you know, there are things about masculinity as it's presented to us by the culture that feel comfortable to me, and there are things that feel very uncomfortable to me. And I found that that's true with, 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 you know, folks I photographed all across the gender spectrum from, you know, men assigned male at birth who identify as heterosexual to like queer trans masculine folks. Like I think that's true for, for everyone I encounter. So, um, you know, I think my interest in masculinity comes from a personal place, but I'm also interested in just opening up these, um, you know, so tightly held beliefs about what gender or sexuality is supposed to be, because I find that it's really, these very narrow expectations are really oppressive for, for everyone, not just, not just queer folks, not just trans folks. Um, so I kind of answered your question and a different question, but went on a little tangent. Also, I have to pause and say that I see that Archie is on the call. Um, hi, Archie. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks for being so, uh, am I allowed to say badass on this call? Thanks for being so badass all those years ago. <laughs> and still, but you know, with me all those years ago. Thanks very much, Jess. So another question, this is from Amber Quinn. Uh, when you did the interviews for Survive, To Survive on the Shore, did you ever consider alternative ways to present your participants' interviews, such as audio or video? Or did you always know it was going to be text only because it was going into a book form? That's a great question. So I did conceive of it as text only from the beginning. Um, and, you know, so I have audio files with everyone, but knowing that it was going to be primarily presented in a book and an exhibition, I took a different approach. You know, I know sometimes when you're recording video, you might ask someone to, you know, say the same sentence multiple times to catch the exact clip that you want. And for me, I was interested in having a very organic conversation knowing that I would edit it later. So I, I, I sort of chose to prioritize the, the content, if that makes sense. Um, and some people had asked me why I wasn't working in video, like why this wasn't a documentary. And for me, you know, at first, my, initially my answer was, well, because I'm a photographer, and I was thinking, well, that's not an answer. And so I was thinking about it more. And um, I think there's something about the photographs and the text that really uh, slow down the moment. And that's something that I'm really committed to in, in all of my work. But in this project in particular, I really wanted 
that control over asking people to really slow down and look and think deeply. And for me, the, the photograph with text functions very differently than a documentary. And I, and I wanted that, that kind of slowness. Um, but basically, yes, I knew from the beginning that I wasn't going to actually use the, the audio um, and I didn't record video. So I, I went into it knowing that. So the audio clips are, you know, the, the, the quote that you read on the wall doesn't exist in, in one chunk in the audio. They were, you know, it was edited from a, from a much longer interview. Yeah, we can have a long conversation about editing interviews. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a big undertaking. And I guess I should add here that, you know, one thing we did is we, um, we, so people often ask me if I let the participants choose, choose the photo. And the answer to that is no, because I, I feel like that's really my voice. I choose the, the final image, but we did send the, the quotes back to each person to approve because there was so much editing and we really wanted each person to feel, you know, like we had edited accurately. And so, um, you know, interestingly, the, the most feedback that we got was, um, you know, people thought they didn't say things like like or um or, you know, since we tried to preserve some of the conversational language. But um, anyway, it was very important to us that people felt felt comfortable with the way we edited. Thank you. So the next question, this is uh, actually something we Justin and I speak about with our class a lot. This is from Roberto Muffoletto. Uh, how do you balance the notion of art and activism? Activism is about movements and politics placing the work in a gallery changes the work and its implications. Sorry, I say that so, again, well, I'm basically, the chat for one second. So okay. how do I balance art and activism? Yeah. Um, so I guess for me, you know, it's funny, I almost put in a picture in this presentation of me as, as a teenager with like a bullhorn uh, downtown Boston. And then I thought that was a little gratuitous, so I didn't, but, um, but for me, when I was younger, my activism was more, um, you know, through nonprofit organizations, through on the street organizing. And as I discovered photography um, and realized that was really my voice, that is where I felt like I had the most power to, to channel my activism. And it became um, a little more subtle. It just took, it took a different form. And so you know, for me, it's I'm, I'm always thinking about balancing art and activism. And I think, you know, how do I want to say this? You know, sometimes when you're making work that has an educational component or is, is made within communities that are marginalized, um, there can be a pressure to lean too heavily toward only educating. And I've always tried really hard to balance the artistic side and the art making and my personal voice. And so um, I really balance those two things. And so, you know, the making of the work is, is sometimes very different for me than the presenting of the work and, and speaking about the work and thinking about what effect it will have in the world. Great, thank you. This, mm -hmm. this next question is maybe sort of somewhat related. Um, it's, this is from Kylie McGill McGillivary, I'm going to say. Um, was photography always an outlet for you for dealing with and expressing your gender and sharing your truth. Um, were you interested in another outlet of art before photography as a way to express yourself? That's a great question. So um, yes, photography always was an outlet for me. I, um, you know, I grew up in a family, uh, I love, you know, well, anyway, that's a whole thing. My family's wonderful, but we didn't go to art museums. And so, you know, I didn't grow up, um, really with much of an awareness of, of, of uh, visual art. And so I actually remember this moment, um, Archie will laugh, but I was sitting outside of my high school drawing. I was doodling, I must have been 13. And the, the art teacher like literally grabbed me by my shirt and took me to the guidance counselor's office and enrolled me in her class. And, um, and I think she thought I was a boy and then we had this confusing moment. Anyway, I like didn't mean to tell that story at all, but I ended up in this art class and, um, and it was so important to me. And then I, I, so I took, you know, I took art, I took ceramics. Um, we had an amazing ceramics teacher who kind of made this incredible amount of space for students. I would go in at like 5.30 in the morning and just, anyway, I'm totally going down a rabbit hole here. But the point is I discovered art making as a teenager and it was incredibly important to me. And it was important to me to express myself, but also I just found this space where I could just be. And that was, was huge. And, um, and then uh, I had tried to get into photography, but um, you know, 
partially due to, to Archie, it was very popular and I, I couldn't get into it till my last year. So I finally got into a photography class my last year and then it was just over. Like I somehow talked my way out of all my other classes and just <laughs> hung out in the dark room all the time. And, um, and I just, from that moment, I was just really sure that that was my voice. And, um, and yeah, it was this amazing way for me to come to understand myself. My, my first images were, you know, obviously I've changed and grown, but they were very similar to, to work I'm making now. So I just sort of immediately fell into uh, portraits and, and, and using my photography as a way to understand myself and, and the world around me. So, um, so yes, as soon as I found art making, it stuck. But then as soon as I found photography, it, it, that just became the lane that I, that I was in. And, and um, I just felt like my voice was the most powerful through that, that medium. Thanks very much. I, I actually, while I wait for someone else to put in a question, can I ask you one too? <laughs> um, sure. I'm also curious, you know, because you've just answered these last two questions about thinking about art and activism and, and sort of an outlook for self-expression. Um, I know you teach as well. And how does that, how do you tie in teaching to, to your work and to the way you're kind of thinking about the ideas in your work? Is that, do you see that as a, a separate or an extension? I'm just, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, I really enjoy teaching. I don't teach in a full-time capacity now, but I've taught um, workshops and I've done a lot of work as a visiting artist at universities over the past six, seven years. And um, I mean, in some ways I feel that it's it's similar to my work in that I think there is power in just kind of sharing who you are and making space for people to share who they are. And so I think part of what I do when I teach is try to make that space for the students. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know that I have too much more to say about that specifically, but I think um, it feels in line with the way that I make work. And then I guess I would, I would say more broadly, I have other projects where I support other artists. I am um, one of the founders, one of the co-founders of the Strange Fire Artist Collective, which is a collective that supports, um, supports and promotes work by women, people of color, and LGBTQ artists. And so uh, that's an outlet where I channel a lot of that particular energy. You know, I interview artists and curators and, um, and, and have some writing there. So, so yeah, I'm really passionate about teaching. Um, and I guess more broadly about uh, mentorship and um, and this is nerdy but perhaps your your class is interested I'm, I'm also really passionate about teaching professional practices to art students because I feel that that's something that we're not often taught and it can feel very intimidating and overwhelming so um, the lanes that I teach presently are portraiture and professional practices those are the the workshops that I teach and um, and yeah I feel really strongly about taking what I've learned and, and making it open and accessible to, to others, people who are trying to figure that out. Hey, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions here. This uh, first one is from RJ Kern, uh, who says, Jess, you set such a high, high bar of excellence. <laughs> Kudos on the effort. Could you speak more about your decision to market the survival on the sh to survive on this shore to specific educational and museum institutions? What did you find the most effective way to connect with decision makers to bring it into their collection? Sure, yeah. Thanks, RJ, for that question. Um, so, like I said, I knew that I wanted that work to serve an educational mission and to go beyond just the exhibition space. So part of why I made the portfolio was to make it more accessible to museums. So the price was lower than my other work. Um, it was possible for a museum to basically buy an entire body of work um, uh, relatively afford affordably. So that was my motivation for doing it. And then, you know, my process, um, I, you know, Mary knows this, we've talked about this extensively, but I actually have a, a, a very large Excel document of museum curators throughout the country. And I had a very targeted approach to um, getting the work in front of, of, in front of curators whose collection I wanted it to be in. And so, um, it took me about a year, I think, to place the edition, but um, 
you know, I did a lot of research about, about um, which kinds of institutions existed, where I wanted it to be. You know, I was trying to place it throughout the United States, so I didn't want them all to end up, you know, on the East Coast or, or in the Midwest. So, um, yeah, and I guess that's one thing that would be useful for the students as well, is to just understand that being an artist, there are two very different components. There's the making of the work, and then there's the promoting and, and marketing of the work and, and that's a necessary component, but they take really different skill sets and energies and they're they're different things. So I try not to think about, you know, marketing the work when I'm making it. I try to just give myself permission to make it, but um but if it's important to you that it's seen and, and collected and you know included in exhibitions, that is an important um aspect. So so yes, once the portfolio was done, I had a very intensive and intentional marketing phase to get it out. Um, and I should also give a shout out to Lightwork. I got a residency at Lightwork in New York. And I went in January of 2018. I remember they thought I was so ridiculous because I, I called and I was like, please, can I have January? I really want January. I really need January. And they were like, yeah, nobody wants January. You can have January. <laughs> it was like two feet of snow and like zero degrees the whole time I was there. But um, but I just printed and I, I printed two exhibitions. I printed the, the museum exhibition that um, Mary showed and I printed a solo show of Every Breath We Drew and then I produced this full edition of, of portfolios in that, that month. And so um, that was hugely important to me. So once that was done, then I, I really started trying to get the work out. So can I interject for just a second, Jess? Yes, and, of course. Um, wasn't, didn't you, email me like a year before we actually had a review at in Santa Fe and that and I bring that up to say um, that sometimes it just takes a long time and that or different kinds of approaches with curators you know like I, I couldn't see it I don't rem I don't remember getting that email but everything about the when we actually did meet you know I remember everything about it you know it just wasn't the right time you know, the, the first uh, contact, which was a year before our review. So I like to um, let students know, especially that it just sometimes it takes a long time and, and, and multiple approaches to where you you have a connection, you know, or it works out, you know, something just as practical as it working out being the right time. Totally. Yeah. I had, I had found you, Mary, because I knew how important UNM was to the history of photography. And um, yeah, and I had asked a mutual friend if he knew you and he said yes. Anyway, so I had emailed Mary, but I pieced together that I think you had just started your, your um, position, which is a, probably a terrible time to take a <laughs> traveling exhibition. So I think that makes sense. But, um, and then when I had a chance to meet you a year later, I was, you know, excited. You were top of my list for, for reviews. So, um, yeah. Thank you, both of you. So the next question is from Trent Thomas, uh, who says, Jess, first off, your work has been on my mind since I first saw it on my college campus four years ago. Thank you for what you do. As a transmasculine person myself, I struggle with publicly showing and explaining art that I make regarding my identity. Did you ever have to get past a similar barrier when you first started to make these works? That's a great question. Um, yes, I mean, I think it's a process. I think it's, it's, um, it can be liberating and really fulfilling to make work that's personal, make work about your own identity and put it out in the world. But I also think you have to be aware of what that means to put something out publicly. I think it can be really vulnerable to open yourself up to anyone's opinion. And it's important to be kind of ready for that moment. I will say for me, you know, the majority of the time it's incredibly fulfilling and rewarding. And, um, you know, every now and then I'll get some strange comment, but I would say what I've learned the most is that by sharing my own story so openly, it really facilitates connections for me with other people and it allows people to share with me and it's, it's incredibly fulfilling. Um, I do think that it's, it's also a reality that there is a certain burden about, um, there's a certain burden when you're part of a marginalized community and you're making work about yourself, right? Like some people make work about 
who they are and no one asked them to you know, educate about an entire group of people when they show that work. So I think it's very real to acknowledge that that is a burden and something you can or cannot take on depending if you, if you want to do that. But, um, but yeah, I think it's complicated, but I also think if, you know, if you're making work that you want to share, I would encourage you to do it. Cause I think it's really, the response is at least for me has been really healing and, and fulfilling. Thank you. Uh, this is from Kendall Green, one of our students. Uh, how did you deal with the process of growing more comfortable sharing your work, especially giving, especially the pieces that are extremely personal? And how has that relationship to sharing your work changed over time? That's a great question. I'm glad that some of your students are asking questions. Um, <laughs> since I don't know which ones are your students. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think you, you kind of hit on a really important point, which is time. And um, I have a rule for myself that I always make the work no matter what. Like I make it and I know that I don't have to show it. I know that it may never see the light of day, but I really strongly try not to censor in the making layer. Um, and sometimes things will feel so personal when I first made them that I can't even fathom talking about them. I mean, I, I sort of got a reputation for crying in grad school all the time because it was just too, the turnaround was too fast for me. You know, I would make something really personal and have to talk about it, you know, two weeks later and I just wasn't ready. And, um, and so I think I've learned as an artist, like there's something really important for me about that passage of time between making and showing. And, um, and that differs for different pieces. You know, some, some pieces I'm, that may seem personal, like a self-portrait, I feel very comfortable putting that out in the world. And then other things like the video piece we talked about, that really took me a long time to be comfortable. And like I said, you know, this is the first time I've spoken about it and it's, it's more than three years old because it's just been, it's so personal. I kind of needed, I needed enough distance where um, it felt like a piece and not like my life. And I think with some photographs that happens faster and I have a distance from them. And with that video, it took a long time. So um, yeah, I think if your work is personal, it's important to honor that time that you need and, and not force yourself to put it out too soon. Um, I will say I have some, a couple of very close friends who, whose opinion I trust and I have, a, I have a kind of very tight knit circle of feedback and so um, you know, when I first made the video, I had, I had a friend, um, a very close friend of mine, Shelburne Thurber, uh, who, who I show everything to. And she was, um, I think my partner was the first person to see it, but Shelburne was the second person to see it. And, um, and so that's really important too. Like, it's okay to have this, this very tight network of, of, of chosen people that you trust and you can show them things that might feel a little more vulnerable. Um, but yeah, for me, the passage of time is, is, is often really important. And things that feel just so painfully personal when I make them, you know, six months later, I'm often like, eh, that's a, that's a photograph. You know, like I just have a, a have distance. But I guess for the students, I would say like, don't censor yourself in the making. You can always make things that you don't have to show. I have, I have tons of work that I don't show publicly. Great, thank you. And thanks, Kendall, for your question. Um, the next question is actually for, for both, both of you, Mary and Jess, and this is from Laura Johnson. Um, Laura says, Jess, I have loved your work for years. Thank you for all that you do, as your work does resonate so deeply with so many people. I work as a curator, but not in photography. Mary and Jess both. If UNM was not as open to such an exhibition, how could or would you have pushed to get it on the rotation? Also, how do you address pushback from board members or influ influential voices in the host community? Hmm. Um, wow, that's going to take some imagination. Because <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, was, it really was not a tough sell either at my institution, you know, the, the museum proper or um, at UNM. Um, Jess, have you had situations where that was a little more of an issue? Um, Cause. Yeah, fun. I guess so. I mean, that's an interesting question. I'm trying to think if I have any tangible examples. Um, I mean, interestingly, now that we're on the eve of this uh, hopefully positive election, I found that something interesting happened um, after the last election, which is that the more progressive parts of our community were um, 
were even more motivated to bring in work that was politically oriented or socially oriented. So I don't feel like I've um, really struggled actually in the past, you know, five or six years to, to have this work shown. Um, I think the question about, you know, pushback from board members or, um, I haven't had it from influential voices in the community, but I do think um, when it comes to funders, that's something to think about, you know, if you have the support of this work. I mean, I have actually, now that I think about it, I've had some curators propose my work and, um, and it get vetoed at, at kind of a, a director or board level. And I don't always know exactly why that is, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting question. I mean, I guess I would also say for me, and, and I'm curious, Mary, if you have more thoughts, but um, you know, I don't necessarily need every institution or every person to get my work. And I kind of feel like this is also just sort of my philosophy as a person. Like I kind of feel like if it's not the right fit, it's not the right fit and I don't push too hard. So I guess I more seek out places where it does seem like the right fit. And so I'm not sure I have, you know, I don't have an example of like really wanting it to go somewhere and having the institution fight me, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think, um, I, you know, the, the work is so appealing. It's just, you know, it's also really beautiful and quiet. And there's this kind of um, appeal to it, I think, that you're, you know, you're very deliberate about, Jess. I mean, we've talked about this, the sort of, and I've heard you speak about it in other venues about um, the aesthetic of it being something that, that draws people in. Um, I think that, that that's very deliberate. I think it comes through very clearly in all, all bodies of your work, all aspects of it. And I think um, it just, there's nothing about it that feels like it's, it's, it's not aggressively trying to push anyone away. You know, there's this, mm -hmm. through the aesthetics of it, I think it's all about drawing people in and um, inviting people into the conversation. And I think to survive, to survive on the shore, the question, or the, the interviews are so, sort of beautifully edited and articulated that, um, you know, there's just so much to, to, to sort of, re that's resonant for anyone who reads, you know, anyone who's just open to being human, you know, but uh, I just think that there's so many entry points, both sort of aesthetic and, and, and then for To Survive on the Shore in particular, um, sort of the content of those interviews provide all kinds of entry points. So I feel like I would, you know, I'd go to the map for that work. It would be, and I don't think it, you know, um, I would be disappointed if, if the answer turned out to be no, but I think that there's every, you know, for those reasons, I think there's so much about it that's appealing that is not a hard sell. Mm. Um, I don't know, I hope that helps. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's, yeah, that's interesting, Mary. I was thinking, um, my biggest, my bigger issue has just been nudity. Like I run into um, issues with nudity, whether it's a museum that caters to school groups, like they have sometimes had issues with having certain images on display or um, yeah, having something reproduced in a magazine. I think that the moments where I've been, you know, come, where I've come up against censorship or, or issues, it's been around nudity, but it's maybe hard to tease that out from um, the fact that it's often queer nudity, but I think it's the nudity and, 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 and usually female nudity that causes problems. Um, so I've definitely had that, but yeah. And I will say I'm grateful every day that um, I'm in a place that where it wasn't difficult to show this work. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you both of you. Uh, I have another question from RJ Kern. Um, what advice, this is Jess, what advice would you have given yourself two years into your first project in terms of one, making work, two, talking about your work, and three, marketing your work to new audiences? Two years in, I don't know if I can pinpoint that exact <laughs> point. Um, I mean, I guess, it, so in terms of making work, and, and hopefully this is of interest to, to your students, Adam and, and Justin, I mean, for me, um, I'm always making work. It's I get cranky if I don't make pictures for a certain amount of time. I just start to get antsy and um, my partner recognizes. She's like, you haven't made a picture in a little while. <laughs> I'm just like irritated, you know? So for me, it's like, I have to make work. It comes from within me. So 
that's one piece. But then I will say, you know, because I work in longer term projects, um, there's often, so my, my projects kind of go in these phases. There's the moment where like I'm starting to see some new pictures and I'm not quite sure what's happening. And then at some point I realize, oh, that's a project. And I like commit to that project and I am really, you know, on a roll. And then there's a messy point in the project where like you're not quite sure how it's coming together or maybe you're kind of sick of it or you need a break. And that for me is where I feel like it's really important to push through. Um, and then there's the moment where it kind of resolves or comes together. And for me, this is like a five to six year trajectory. This is like a longer period of time. So that's one thing. Um, you know, I'm also always working on multiple projects. The whole time I was making To Survive on the Shore, I was also making Every Breath We Drew and the family work. So there were moments where I either couldn't work on To Survive on the Shore because I needed to travel or, um, you know, the making of that work was very emotionally taxing on me as well. So I would often make five or six portraits and then, you know, need a break to, to make some different work. And so, um, or, you know, just practically having access to certain subjects and, and not others. So I find it really helpful to go back and forth. And then um, the question about marketing, I mean, that's a bigger, a bigger discussion, I think, in some ways. But I would say, you know, for the students, I think, you know, it, it's important to kind of have a sense of what your work is before you put it out. It doesn't mean it has to be done, but it, you know, it, it's, it's important that it's at a, enough of a point where you're, you can say, like, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm interested in it. Um, but I also think it's okay. You know, you can start showing work. You can start talking about work before it's finished. And so um, I think that's going to be different for every person. And, and also identifying, um, you know, what your my cat is on the table in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, also identifying like what your, <laughs> what your, um, mm -hmm. you know, hope is for the work. Like, do you want it in a gallery space? Do you want it in a museum space? Do you want it in a community space? Do you want to use it for dialogue? Do you want to create performances or, or happenings? Like, I think it's important to also think about, you know, what is success for you as an artist and, and how do you work toward that? I don't think, I don't think every artist necessarily has the same goal or you know has the same same end um end point so i think that's another thing to think about before you even begin trying to put it out in the world thank you so actually we have a, another question from one of our students this is comac uh what is an example of the most difficult part of your practice during a project like to survive on this shore and what is the most rewarding part that's a great question so to survive on this shore, I mean, I just mentioned there were times where it was emotionally intense, but I wouldn't say that was actually difficult. That was just part of the process. Um, you know, for a project like that, it required a lot of logistics. There was a lot of travel. Um, I had to figure out how to fund um, all these trips throughout the United States. So there was a massive amount of, of organization, and that was at times hard and, and challenging. And, and um, you know, I spent a lot of time like emailing and calling and, um, you know, just the, the nuts and bolts side of making that work. So in some ways that was, was one of the more difficult parts because it just took a lot of time. Um, I really loved meeting each person. I mean, I loved making that work. I loved that as I traveled throughout the country, I got to connect with people in this really intimate way that I wouldn't have ever met without this work. It just brought me into so many amazing homes and lives and stories. So, you know, I think the most reward, I think there are multiple rewarding parts. There was one for me in making it that I was just so humbled and moved by everyone welcoming us into their life and sharing their story. It was just incredibly emotional and meaningful for me. Um, and then I also think, you know, the showing of it has been, has been really rewarding, just seeing that it's had a positive impact on people. You know, I've heard from some of the participants, one in particular shared that his family never accepted him, never used the right pronoun, never used the right name, and he shared the book with them and they, they all apologized to him and, and started um, treating him the way he had asked to be treated, which is just so amazing. I almost can't like take that information in, you know? Um, and just hearing from a lot of parents of trans kids that it's meaningful for them and hearing from young trans folks that it's meaningful for them. So I think it's, you know, making it was really rewarding and, and in a lot of ways healing for me to just hear from, from so many, um, you know, older adults in my community. Um, and then, 
yeah, the showing it and just hearing that it has a positive impact on, on other people has been um, just, yeah, incredibly rewarding. Thank you. So I think we have time for maybe just one or two more questions. I have one from Heather Walsh. How has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the making of your work? That's a great question. So uh, it's such a wacky time for all of us. Um, you know, it's definitely affected my work. A lot of my practice is photographing other people and I, um, for multiple reasons, but you know, mostly personal and, and relating to family, I've, I've leaned fairly conservative on, on what risks I'm willing to take. So I'm not photographing people indoors right now. I'm not, I'm not um, doing a lot of the things that I did before. So that's one major effect. Um, I am making portraits, but just outside and, and in a kind of limited capacity. One major upside is that those early months when I was alone in the house, um, or I, not alone, but in the house and not traveling and, um, you know, for better or worse, my professional life kind of stopped in March and April. Like I work primarily with museums and universities and they were all just not doing anything. So um, I had this immense amount of quiet and uh, I mean, plus a toddler, but professionally I had quiet. And so I actually found it really inspiring. I, I returned to making self portraits, which I've always done, but I, came back to that in a more intense way. I started making some still life images like the flowers that I showed you. I have a, a whole series of, of new ones from this year. Um, and I think I wouldn't have necessarily made the pictures I made if I hadn't had that interruption. So that was a, a positive and unexpected aspect of this otherwise difficult situation. Um, and right now, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't travel, which was a huge part of my um, both my practice and my income. So that's all been a little wacky and, um, and I can't photograph other people easily. So I've, I've been struggling a little bit to find new people to photograph. Um, but I have been doing that locally. I have a show next fall at the St. Louis Art Museum and I've, I'm very intensely making new work for Every Breath We Drew for that. So um, anyway, so I'm working on that here, but yeah, it, it had a huge impact and I think it's still kind of shaking out for me what the, what the future of that is going to look like. I mean, I'm incredibly grateful that, um, for example, I had finished to survive on the shore because that would just be impossible right now. So, um, so I'm making the more personal work and I'm making some, some portrait work of, of other people in a, in a kind of limited capacity. Thank you. So any final questions? Now's the time to type them. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll wrap. Oh, yeah, and thanks for hanging in, everybody. Yeah. We've yeah. been here for a while, so. Okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing none. So I'll thank you so much to both of you. Thank um, you both so much. It was really, uh, it was really terrific to, to have you come. And we so appreciate you taking the time and, and being so uh, candid and, and open and honest with us. It was terrific. Thank you.